There's a commonly held belief that humans started as extremely primitive and evolved into higher levels over time. But how smart was ancient man? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And on today's episode, we're going to ask the question, how smart was ancient man? How smart were they? Yeah. Well, evolutionists, <laughs> you know, often paint a tale of, of human history starting with, you know, we've got hairy ape-like creatures and they get a little bit smarter. And right. finally they turn into, you know, the first proto-humans or first, you know. They uh, invent fire and then they grunt and then they learn how to speak. Yeah. And, yeah. And they, they, start living in caves and a little while later they become hunter-gatherers and then finally they get ag agriculture and then they get technology and etc. But, but the, the main point here is that you start with low intelligence and you go to high intelligence and that's where societies uh, evolve. Right. Basically. And of course the Bible paints a very different picture. We have, yes. for example, in, in Genesis 4, uh, we read this. Ada bore Jabal and he was the father of all those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Wow, look at that. Yeah. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah was also born to Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Right. Wow, a lot of technology there, right? And that's Genesis 4, it's the fourth chapter of the Bible. Exactly. So right off the bat, the Bible describes people as having herds and they make tents and they make musical instruments. I don't know about you, but if somebody you know, said, hey, Cal, you, you, you go make me a bronze instrument or, 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 a, or, or a, an instrument yeah. out of metal. I don't care yeah. if it's out of wood. Good luck with that. I, it's not not having happen. any previous template to go from. I mean, not modifying some existing uh, instrument, well, coming up with an honest, instrument from nothing. Even if you gave me a template, I'm not going to do it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> and we read in Job, uh, you know, Job 28, 1 to 2, this is right after the flood, uh, basically chronologically, when we're talking it's about the It's a very old book in the Bible, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Job 28, 1 to 2, 28, surely there's a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. So the Bible tells us that right from the beginning, humans were intelligent. Uh, there's no climb up the evolutionary ladder, nothing like that going on according to scripture. That's right. Now, obviously, biblical creationists and evolutionists are going to disagree about you know, pre-human species, the so-called hominids or ape men or, you know, the, the, the sure. precursors to humans. So um, we're, we've, we've already tackled that on different shows and, and then you can look that up on the different uh, episodes we've done. But um, what we really want to tackle here is, okay, let's talk about the people that both creationists and evolutionists admit were people. Right. Now, now, evolutionists will still uh, may have a caveat in there and say, yeah, but they, they, they were the beginning people, you know, Neanderthals or whatever. We'll, we'll get into some of these things. But, but they're still considered people, homo, in, 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 in their uh, you know, version of history and in our version of history. So it, it, just so we don't get confused here. Um, so, that's, so really what the argument we want to set up is, how primitive were actual people? Actual people, right. We're not exactly. talking about uh, what the evolutionists call ape people or something right. like that. So what we're, to, to sum it up then, where do the cavemen fit into the Bible? We'll, we'll look at that. Those were actual people. Right. Uh, are primitive societies less evolved? There are primitive societies still today, obviously. Are, right. are they less evolved? Is there evidence that ancient civilizations had a high technology? Right. Something that would surprise us, uh, but, surprise people. But not if we take the Bible as plainly not written. If we, right. Surprise most people. Right. If, if, you're, if you're indoctrinated with the evolutionary notion right. that people before us were, were dumber than we are. And also, does a lack of technology prove less intelligence? Right. Um, just because a society doesn't have you know, computers and cell phones and stuff like that, does that mean that they're not intelligent? <laughs> right. So we'll look at that as well. Exactly. So up next, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the, the amazing artifacts that have been found from uh, quite a while ago right. and, uh, and just dig into these questions a little further. We'll be right back. In nature documentaries and science textbooks, one often hears about creatures that arrived at their body plan very early in evolutionary history and have not made any real changes since that time, supposedly millions of years ago. These are called living fossils, like the coelacanth and the walmy pine. 
This phenomenon is known as stasis, things staying pretty much the same, and it turns out that pretty much every animal in the entire fossil record appears suddenly and shows this same history of stasis. This was not predicted by evolution. A more recent and radical theory called punctuated equilibrium recognises stasis in the fossil record but requires belief in rapid massive leaps in evolution, an unsubstantiated just-so story. However, the physical evidence, sudden appearance and stasis in the fossil record fits remarkably well with the biblical account of a recent creation followed by a devastating global flood just as the Bible describes in Genesis. To find out more from Creation Ministries International visit our website creation.com Welcome back to Creation Magazine Live. So how smart was ancient man? Pretty smart. <laughs> uh, a little while ago now CBC News uh, released a story about a device made between 150 BC and, a, and 100 BC that was discovered in a, in a shipwreck in 1901, uh, from 1901, off the Greek islands of Antikythera. And so they call what they found in the shipwreck the Antikythera device. Um, now, first uh, point I wanted to make here is they, they found this device encased in rock. And they, they actually had to do, uh, take x-rays to, to see what was in there before they started chiseling it out and stuff like that, which the first point I just wanted to make from that is that it doesn't take a long time for rock to, um, to form. Yeah, uh, yeah. Many people think that Interesting it takes, side takes note, but look yep. at that x-ray there. That, uh, what kind of a device is that thing? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's pretty sophisticated, as the uh, article goes on to say. Yeah, the article describes the device in glowing terms with, with comments like just extraordinary and the way the mechanics are designed just makes your jaw drop. Right. Uh, whoever has done this has done it extremely well. Those are, those are some of the comments there. Right. And, um, and, and as well here, uh, uh, describing the machine as an analog computer, so that they're, <laughs> they're calling this thing a computer. Yeah. It states that it possesses a differential gear, commonly associated, of course, with your, with your car and was capable of tracking the movements of the sun and moon and even eclipses. Right. So it's some kind of a, a telescope-like device, some tracking device. And it's also uh, suspected of being capable to follow the planets. That's pretty complex. Pretty brilliant uh, engineering, of course, as you take a look at the device. It looks very sophisticated, but w one of the main points from the article was this. The greater question puzzling scientists is how such a useful device could have disappeared entirely from the archaeological record, so much so no record of anything as complex appears for another 1,000 years. See here, this is, this is very interesting. It, it is. Where did the technology go? I mean, if they had it back then, but there's no other record of it except for 2,000 years ago. Nothing's been preserved in that intervening, inter intervening 1,000 years. Yep. Yet it, yet it was there back, <laughs> exactly. back in the day. It would, there was this high technology device, or whatever it was used for. London Science Museum curator Michael Wright states this, um, I find it easy to believe that this technology survived unrecorded as to believe that it was reinvented in so similar a form. See, just because we don't you know, have a record of, of something you know, way back when doesn't mean they, they didn't have it. We just don't have a record of it. Right. So you yeah. can't automatically make the assumption, well, if we you know, find some, uh, some remains of where people used to live, and, and we think it was a long time ago, but they did, you know, we don't see any sophisticated technology, you can't just make the jump and say, well, they didn't have it. Right. right. But the, the, the main point here, of course, is that the, the people, the, the group or person or individual, whoever designed this thing was very intelligent. That's the point. Exactly. It's an old machine, some type of a tracking device, and it's extremely complicated. Yeah. Now, technology has advanced very quickly uh, during the last 100 years, of sure. course. Yep. And, and this is primarily due to the, the, uh, the fact that we can record, we can share ideas. Right, um, you, you can quickly get up to speed. If, I mean, if I really wanted to build a musical instrument, I suppose I could, uh, uh, you know, learn how to yeah. do that. But how I would do that is by going and researching information that was already there, left behind by people who've gone before me. Right, stand on the shoulder uh, of, of people who've gone before me, and um, and do that. I mean, people are very, very quickly going to revert to a, a primitive state uh, within a very short period of time. Um, for example, uh, you know, you get a group of people on an airplane and then the airplane crashes and they make it to a deserted island. Well, very quickly, they're going to look primitive. If you came upon them 10 years later, you're going to find them living in local caves. If they only have the shirts off their back, they're not going to have technology, your cell phone. That's yeah. not going to be any, any use. Right. No it's, electricity. So, you don't, don't have toasters or, or ovens or, or computers or anything like that. So it's a, it's a massive drop in technology that's at that right. point. And, uh, 
you know, we see all sorts of uh, indications that there was high technology throughout history. In 1936, while excavating ruins of a 2,000-year-old village near Baghdad, workers discovered a mysterious small vase. And they call it the Baghdad Battery. Yes, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it's six inches high. You can see here in the, uh, the picture. Uh, it's a six-inch high pot of bright uh, yellow clay dating back two millennia. It contains a, a cylinder of sheet copper, five inches by one and a half inches. And the edge of the copper cylinder was soldered with a 60 to 40 lead tin alloy comparable to today's solder. Uh, the bottom of the cylinder was capped with a crimped in copper disc concealed with bitumen or asphalt. Another insulating layer of asphalt sealed the top and also held in place an iron rod suspended into the center of the copper cylinder. And the rod showed evidence of having been corroded with an acidic agent. So they feel hmm. that this was a battery. And this works well with, uh, with uh, information from uh, Dr. Colin Fink of uh, the electrochemistry department at Columbia University. And he said that the ancient Egyptians copper-coated many artifacts using a form of electrochemical exchange. This involved a mixture of chemical elements which, when an object was immersed, caused an electrochemical charge that deposited the copper permanently on the object. So electroplating. That's just amazing. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so the advances uh, that we see in technology, yeah, we, we, we get advances, but it doesn't mean people uh, long ago didn't have that information. It's just that when you don't have countries with large police forces, with armies, to protect your technology, well, that can quickly get destroyed and, and, and so on. So right. let's uh, yeah. we're, we're stay tuned. We're going to look into some other amazing finds from so-called primitive man. Richard Van Grad and Calvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. Welcome back. We're talking about high technology in ancient civilizations. Now think of the 16, more than 1600 years before the flood. There's in, in just the last 100 years, the invention of the automobile, electricity came right. in wide usage. Uh, the invention of the airplane in 47, we broke the sound barrier. 69, put men on the moon. There was more than 1600 years before the flood. Uh, now that technology would have been limited by what you just said in the last segment there, no police force or recording that information, but there could have been a high technology That's to right. some extent before the flood. And uh, you know, there, there are misconceptions. What you believe about history uh, you know, can, can sway how you're going to look at evidence. Okay? Um, i give you an example. When the first European explorers set foot in Tasmania, uh, the large island that's off the southeast uh, coast of Australia. Um, and the local uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal people, they seem to have only a few ultra basic Stone Age implements. Now we're going to go through some information here to make a point about, you know, preconceived notions and technology and how f intelligent people are and stuff like that. I right. mean, the, the, the Tasmanians were, were treated absolutely brutally if, if you look into the history of their people and it's a really sad story basically hunted to extinction, it literally hunted as specimens for museums in some cases as, as missing links. So yeah, they incredible. were viewed by the uh, Europeans as, as less than human uh, because of many of the things that they found. Even, even today anthropologists commonly tell the story that they appear to know nothing uh, about simple devices and that other tribes had, such as friction tools to light fires and that, that type of thing, yep. uh, bone needles to sew and the like. Uh, despite the cold climate of this massive island, uh, the people would go around naked, uh, apart from being smeared with animal fat and that right. type of thing. So. Having no way of starting a fire, they'd actually carry, you know, burning coals and firebrands with them and things like that. Um, they, they didn't seem to have, uh, you know, handles for their, for their axes. They didn't use uh, boomerangs like, uh, you know, the, the, the people on the mainland did. Um, they didn't eat fish, which, you know, so they didn't even have fish catching technology. And so all of these things that were observed by, by people coming to look at them uh, made them think that they were very uh, low on the evolutionary Extremely scale. Extremely primitive, yeah. yeah. There are two basic responses to how this situation could arise. One is to look at Revelation. Uh, the Bible teaches that all people living today are the descendants of those that dispersed from Babel. And, uh, and, and that was obviously a community building, you know, 
they, they built buildings. Right. Uh, they, they had a high technology uh, back at that time. Right. So unfortunately, though, most of the European settlers in Tasmania didn't allow the reason to really be guided by revelation. What they had started to buy into is the concept that, well, if these people don't have high technology, then their mental capacity is lower. And so they're, in, in a sense, subhuman and, and, right. and, and low on the evolutionary scale, right? Um, yeah, although this was before Darwin, evolutionary ideas have been around for, for a long, long time before Darwin. Yep. Darwin's grandfather had his own theory of evolution, and it goes uh, long before that time. Uh, many assume that the reason that Tasmanian society was was low tech is because they they had uh, they, they were not that far removed from their animal ancestors. That's right. One of the early explorers, Captain Betts, said this: the Tasmanians may almost be said to be uh, are said to form the connecting link between man and monkey tribes. Uh, so they were, that's the reason why they were looked down upon like that. Yeah, the alleged technological primitivity of the Tasmanians has been greatly exaggerated <laughs> according to a, a rare 1837 book by Jorgen Jorgensen who, uh, who lived with the Tasmanians. And, uh, and here you see a picture of that book there. In it he recorded this, they certainly did know how to make fire. However, the general dampness of the wood in Tasmania's harsh rainy climate made it more practical to carry embers from one campsite to the next. Right. So uh, in, in, in an island where there's almost a complete absence of indigenous grains, nuts and fruits and, and notorious for sudden, you know, freezing local squalls and things like that, it, it didn't make sense to build you know, permanent dwellings. It right. was a lot better to be quickly be able to, to pick up and move. And so, uh, you know, they actually in some parts of the island, Jor Jorgensen records that they did build substantial uh, permanent dwellings. But for the most part, on the on the outskirts and stuff, they just constantly be moving, etc. Okay. So they did have that capability, that That's technology. Right. The yep. squally weather meant that clothing clothing could sometimes be a hindrance, a disadvantage. Many Tasmanians died of pneumonia after clothing pressed upon their bodies by well-meaning Europeans uh, became rain-soaked and, and froze them. That's right. And uh, this lack of boomerangs and things like that, well, the fact is that there's a lot of trees on the island, so no need to use that type of thing. So Wrong basically, yeah. it, they were well adapted to their uh, environment, not less technologically uh, advanced. And more in the next segment. Most people don't like to be told they have a big head, but some scientists might actually consider that a compliment. Humans have much larger skulls than apes, and since humans are much more intelligent, there's been a long-standing belief that skull size indicates level of intelligence. That's why evolutionists tend to interpret slightly larger ape skulls as advanced apes and slightly smaller human skulls as subhuman. But this evolutionary story has multiple problems. Neanderthals were supposedly primitive, often portrayed as subhuman, but their skulls are actually bigger than ours. Also, the winner of the 1921 Nobel Prize for Literature had a tiny skull, 25% less than today's average volume. The reality is that skull size is a poor intelligence indicator. After all, the average skull size of men is greater than that of women, although there is no consistent difference in intelligence. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Now we just finished talking about the Tasmanians who had an apparent massive loss of techno or, or lack of technology yeah. and they were primitive, but had they been seen through biblical eyes, through revelation, through the truth, they would have been seen as a people group that descended from Babel with a high technology and they've lost that since that time. Right, and they would have been treated accordingly rather yes. than like animals, right. uh, etc. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, cave people that were are supposedly closest to us would, of course, be the Neanderthals. And uh, many people will have seen pictures of Neanderthals, uh, you know, there's commercials on TV, oh, you know, smart, smart enough, even a caveman can do it. And, and, of course, when I was learning about Neanderthal in school, they were always, you know, brutish creatures with huge, you know, eyebrows and, and just, just barely human, you know, proto-humans. Yes. Yeah. Of course, uh, Neanderthals have got a bit of a makeover in the last little while as we've done DNA studies and, and, and found out that a lot of the original Neanderthals, you know, they had bone diseases and rickets and stuff like that. That gave them that stooped over appearance and so on. But right. then, then here's some pictures of, of people that look, uh, Neanderthals apparently, that, uh, yeah, that look, uh, uh, look pretty much like us. Look pretty normal. But and of course, a couple of people have actually, uh, you know, taken Neanderthal um, models and dress them up, uh, you know, with, with modern clothing and, and making a point. Well, guess what? Um, we see people with these kind of features in our, in our modern society. 
Pretty much. Yeah. So you know what? It doesn't mean that they weren't people. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that have been discovered about Neanderthals. Yeah, they've, um, they've recently discovered that Neanderthals wore makeup. Uh, there's <laughs> there's right. evidence of things buried with them that suggests that they uh, uh, they painted themselves up. So, <laughs> that's very interesting. Right. And, and uh, also that they wore jewelry. And uh, one comment here from one of the studies says, to archaeologists, ornaments like shells and body painting aren't just ornaments. They're evidence of symbolic thinking, things that represent ideas. So, I mean, obviously, you're going to wear jewelry, you're going to wear makeup, you're trying to improve your appearance. I guess a lot of people would say, well, Neanderthals needed to improve their appearance. <laughs> well, don't we all? <laughs> you know? But um, we're, we're a fallen race. But uh, anyway. They, they recently discovered religious artifacts uh, that they buried their dead with, and that, that's that's quite well known. Right. Um, so there's 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 things there that denote that they believed in an afterlife. Right. That it was not, uh, you know, they again, that links them with true humanity. They're real humans that lived after Babel, very likely, and they understood that there was an afterlife. They understood right. the truth. They've actually found musical instruments. This uh, article from NBC News, it says a bone flute apparently carved from the femur of a cave bear and discovered in a cave in Slovenia where Neanderthals lived supposedly 43,000 years ago. We wouldn't uh, believe in that time scale, but they're making musical instruments. Well, what's the Bible say? People made musical Genesis instruments from, Genesis the, 4. from yeah. the first, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, uh, Neanderthals bred with modern humans. That's what evolutionists are telling us. Yep. Uh, no surprise there. Well, they, what does that they mean? They were humans. They're, they're people, <laughs> right? Dogs don't breed with cats and make some kind of hybrid. Right. So if, yes. if, if humans and, and, and Neanderthals were breeding, that means they're, they're humans. <laughs> that, that's all you can really go by. Yeah, from our perspective, that, that's really no surprise. Right. They were humans anyways. They bred with humans. The evolutionists are now saying, well, yeah, of course they bred with humans. That's they're right. humans. You know, many of the artifacts we find just completely mystify uh, people sometimes. You know, the, the uh, Acheulean hand axe, it, it's just, you'll see them all over the world. They found them like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these hand axes, almond shaped, you know, about, about this big. And uh, they always called them the ha a hand axe. And supposedly 1.7 million years ago, hominids were using this hand axe. But it's always puzzled people because the problem with the hand axe is that they were sharp all the way around. And, and they, there was no evidence that they ever had a half. They were never on a, oh, on a, okay. on a hand. Yeah, and hand axe, well, how would you hold the thing right. without so if chewing your hand up? If you're doing up. this, you're going to cut your hand up. They said, well, maybe there were a scraper, and well, that doesn't really work. Why mm. wouldn't you use a smaller thing? So finally, this, this uh, lady, Eileen uh, O'Brien from the University of Georgia, she got a, a bright idea. And, and she made a resin cast of one of these things that was as heavy as one, and she got the local discus um, team to oh, okay. start hurling these things. And here's what she <laughs> discovered. They go up in the air, they tip on their edge, and they fall. And usually 70% of the time when they fall, they fall point first. But regardless of which way they fall, they always land on an edge. Okay. And what confused many uh, archaeologists is they would always find these hand axes, uh, many times buried, pointing straight up in, in old riverbeds and things like that. Okay. And so what she's uh, thought of now is that perhaps these were projectile weapons used by people when they found herds at water holes. And so you'd stand back from a very high, you know, far away, you'd shoot them. Like artillery, they'd come up, drop on the things. Ancient people weren't dumb at all. <laughs> T-Rex <laughs> attacks. <laughs> we'll be back. Everyone likes to get things for free. Thanks to donors at Creation Ministries International, we have put great effort into making huge amounts of faith-building information freely available online. Creation.com now has more than 8,000 articles. Some of CMI's most popular books are in PDF format to read online for free. All 48 episodes of Creation Magazine Live and other teaching videos are online at no charge. Consider making a donation, enabling us to continue producing free faith-building information. This is our In the News segment here, and uh, we've got some a very interesting piece yes. of information. Yeah. C14 in dinosaur bones. Wow, this was a, a really interesting article that came out recently on our website talking about some information that was found. Now, um, in case you don't know why this is important, uh, C14, uh, carbon-14 dating methods, should only be able to, because of the half-life of, of, of carbon-14, you should yeah. not be able to detect any C14 in any sample from a living thing over 100,000 years or, old. Or thereabouts. Yeah, C14 is too radioactive. It decays too quickly. It doesn't last that long. That's right. Yeah. However, a team of researchers gave a presentation uh, at the uh, 2012 Western Pacific Geophysics Meeting in Singapore, August 13th to 17th, and uh, one of the presenters um, gave C14 results 
from bone samples from eight different dinosaur uh, specimens. All given dates range from 22,000 to 39,000 years. Now, if, if you calculate, and obviously with the, the account of the flood and the fact that you know C14 hasn't been you know um, accumulating at, at a at a constant rate, what, what creationists would believe, and you'd have to go on our website to yeah, look into this yeah. more. The, the flood would have affected the carbon balance in the atmosphere, so right. the, 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 you, you would need recalibration to get it within the biblical right. time frame. But, but that uh, would be right in the ballpark predicted by creationists between yes. 22,000 to 39,000, not that they're that old, but after the calibration. Yeah. But if dinosaurs were really millions of years old, there shouldn't be any C14 left in any one of them, and right. here we have eight of them that had it. Now, Here's the interesting part of the story. That, that's very interesting. But if you go to the website, and this is recorded in the article on uh, uh, C14, just look up uh, creation.com dinosaur uh, C14. And you, they, you can actually go to the website where they published, you know, where the different sessions were being put. For this conference. For this yes. conference. And session number five talks about C14 and dinosaur bones. However, Okay, here, this is, uh, this is a quote from this... Uh, yeah, from the uh, press release From here. the press release. The, the abstract was removed from the conference website by two chairmen because they could not accept the findings. Unwilling to challenge the data openly, they erased the report from public view without a word to the authors or even to the AOGS officers until after an investigation. It won't be restored. <laughs> That's right. So if you go to wow. the, the website from this conference now, you, you can look up you know, different days and you click on it and it, and it opens up. So this is later. The, uh, yeah, and I blow this up now and you can see it goes from session one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Number five has been removed. Gone. Because they can't accept the findings. See, this yeah. shows that dinosaurs... They can't be millions of years old if yeah. there's carbon-14 in like, them. It's like, don't attack my belief system. I believe dinosaurs are millions of years old. You, I, I can't process this data that suggests that they're not, and therefore I'm just going to squash it. <laughs> it, it well, isn't it? Uh, that sounds silly, but isn't that what they're doing? Exactly. It's exactly the, what the, they're the doing. The thing is, though, you, you know, it, it, the presentation was given. You can actually go uh, on YouTube and, and, uh, and look this up. So you can, you can see the presenter, and he gives all the data. This is, this is you know, hard research that, that they're trying to basically get rid of. At the end of the session, uh, you'll see the, the fellow, when he does his summary, he says, well, you know, this, this kind of matches. We've got C14 in dinosaur bones. We've found soft tissue in dinosaur bones. We've found red blood cells in dinosaur bones. We've found protein in dinosaur bones. And, of course, recently we had an article on, the, on our website where it talked about dino DNA, DNA. being found. <laughs> you know what this all points to? Dinosaurs didn't die out millions of years ago. Supports biblical history. Exactly. So go to our website, look up dinosaurs, more information about them. See you next time.